Today we're going to be talking about salvation, Orthodox understanding of it, and did she have any role at all? Uh, and what are some of the misconceptions or the confusions or distortions when it comes to her role in salvation? Luke chapter 1, verse 38. Behold, as we just heard, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word, and the angel of the Lord departed from me. St. Mary, more than anyone else in human history, was able to say yes to God. She said, let it be to me according to your word. And for that reason, we're having this conversation today. Because she said yes, she was all in. She didn't say, like, you can have most of me. She said, you can have all of me. I'm all yours. Do with me as you will. I'm your maid, sir. The truth that I really hope that we'll walk out of today with is as follows. When we look at the life of St. Mary, we see a woman who surrendered her life fully to Christ. And I believe the more we surrender our will to God, the more the healing power of Jesus becomes accessible. The more you and I surrender our will to God, the more the healing power of Jesus himself becomes accessible to the world around us. Becomes accessible first to us and to the people who we cross paths with. Because St. Mary surrendered her will fully to God, Jesus and his healing power became accessible in a very real and different way than with us, but yet became accessible 2,000 years ago through her. One of the big questions that we're going to be talking about today, the big reason why any of this matters, is what is her role in the economy of salvation? What like, did she do anything special or unique or different? And what are all the confusions that people have specifically about St. Mary? If you want to know the one thing that really divides so many people, so many different groups of Christians, it has to do with what we think about St. Mary. It's, it's such an interesting thing. And I think part of the problem is it's so polarizing because people don't sit down and have discussions about it and they don't talk about it, and they don't look back and see like, see her within the fuller picture. The origin of the confusion way, 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 way back when started back in the 5th century, okay? And there was a, a guy, his name was Proclus of Constantinople. He was a priest uh, in Constantinople. And he was actually invited to, to preach in uh, the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul or Constantinople, the big cathedral there. And he preached a sermon on the incarnation of Christ. And as he was preaching, he spoke about St. Mary in a very lavish way. One of the people who was there was this bad dude named Stories. Stories, right? Stories, now, I know history has given him a worse rap than he probably deserves, okay? But his teaching was very disruptive, I would say, and distorted when it comes to who Christ is. What Nestorius, who was the patriarch, he was the, if you will, the, the bishop or the, the head of the church in Constantinople, what he basically said is that Jesus is a blend, he's a mixture of God and man. Okay? This was his big problem. He said that in the human person that we see Jesus, God is living just simply inside of him, like a temple, okay? And so, for him, salvation was about a cooperation between the human and divine persons in the person of Christ. What happened with Proclus is Proclus, when he was teaching, he basically taught about St. Mary what Nestorius believed about Christ. And so that's why Nestorius got up and rebutted because he really felt like he was taking certain things from Christ and attributing them to St. Mary. And what I would suggest to you is that the church's Mary is actually Nestorius' Christ. What Nestorius believed about St. Mary, 
sorry, what Nestorius believed about Christ, we believe about St. Mary. And by extension, we believe about the church, the body of Christ. Because you all will remember, whatever we say about St. Mary, in almost every way, by extension, is accessible to the body of Christ, to the church. She is an icon of the church. Okay? She is, we, we refer to her as, as the second heaven, which is really what, when we look at the church, the church is, what is heaven? It's the dwelling place of God. Where does God dwell except for among his people, the body, the church? Okay? So when we speak about all these things, as an icon, they're also directing us symbolically to the church. When we say that St. Mary stands to the right hand of the king, we're saying that the church is to stand to the right hand of the king. When we say that St. Mary is clothed with the royal inheritance in a unique way, true, we also speak that about the church, the body of Christ. The reason why the church continued to teach Christ's Nestorius, Nestorius is Christ, as uh, our, as St. Mary, okay? the reason why we basically attributed the things that Nestorius believed about Christ to St. Mary and to the, the, the church is number one, the uniqueness of what Jesus Christ did in the work of salvation. Nestorius missed the boat on. Okay? And secondly, it, it, if you will, his view of salvation greatly reduced our understanding of what Christ did in the Incarnation. Let me put it more simply, if you will. Nestorius believed in the person of Jesus. There were two persons inside him, a divine person and a human person. What St. Cyril of Alexandria said is that there was the one incarnate nature of person, one incarnate nature of God the Word. In other words, it wasn't about two people coming together and cooperating. That cooperation what y'all said in the discussion, that cooperation was what we do with God. Okay? God didn't come to cooperate with us. He came to take what was ours so that we could live a life of synergy and cooperation with Him. Okay? That's the distinction. Now, if those were, that was the old confusion, we've got some contemporary confusions to have, okay? Contemporary confusions, I will say, probably started developing around the 12th, 13th, 14th century. And have later developed and kind of been dogmatized, uh, more so in the Catholic Church. And the Protestant response to it has taken an opposite approach, okay? So I just want to lay out there, I've said where we stand, and I'll develop that a little bit more. But I want to help you understand where all this other confusion comes from and how it developed later, okay? So there were two confusions that happened, if you will, within the Catholic Church later. The first one is the name of co-redemptrix, or co-redeemer, if you will. Uh, we don't believe it as a dogma. It was something that later developed. And the idea of co-redemptrix basically says the following. It refers, in St. Mary, to an essential and subordinate participation in the process of redemption. Notably that she gave her consent to give life to the Redeemer, which we are fine with, that part, but it's the rest of it that we have a more difficult time with. To share his life, to suffer with him under the cross, to offer his sacrifice to God the Father for the sake of the redemption of mankind. So, what happened a few centuries back is basically the Catholic Church said, you know, they, it was a, a further development, and I'll share with you something that Pope Benedict said a few years back that he wrote in an article. Basically said that although St. Mary, we agree that she shared her life so that the Redeemer could come, they went on to say that she also suffered with him in the cross, which was affecting the role of salvation, which we don't believe, and that she offered up the sacrifice to the Father, okay? Now this comes from a, more of a Western view of salvation, uh, of the blood atonement focus of salvation, uh, which is not necessarily what the Orthodox Eastern view of salvation focuses in on. 
Pope, Pope Benedict says the following. He says, the formula, co-redemptrix, departs to too great an extent from the language of scriptures and of the fathers, and therefore gives rise to misunderstandings. Everything, everything comes from Christ. As the letter to the Ephesians and the letter to the Colossians in particular tells us, Mary too is everything she is through him. The word co-redemptrix would obscure this origin, a correct intention being expressed in the wrong way. So he's saying it's fair, like the intention was good. The intention was to say like she gave birth to the Redeemer. She bore the Redeemer. But there was a deviation. Okay? So that was one of the contemporary confusions. The other one <clears throat> came out of it, which is called, which refers to her as the Mediatrix. Mediatrix basically says the following. The intercessory role of the Virgin as a mediator in redemption by her son Jesus allows that all the graces pass to us through her. Okay? So she's the mediator, mediator for all the grace of God to pass through her to humanity. All right? We would say, of course, that she's nothing without Christ. And it's for that reason, it's for that reason why, if you notice in every one of the Orthodox icons that St. Mary is in, and that Christ is in, she's always pointing to Christ. She's always directing everything back to Christ. He's the Redeemer. He's the Savior. Okay? He's the attention. When we speak about St. Mary, even we're always, anything that we're saying of her should be pointing us back always to Christ. One of the Catholic theologians said that the whole idea of the Mediatrix is neither scriptural nor do we find in early church fathers, uh, but it developed after the Great Schism. Okay? So whether it was co redemptress or mediatrix, both of these are later developments. What happened as a result in the 17th, 18th century, during the era of the Reformation, there was taken an extreme opposite polar response to these two confusions or distortions. Which basically said, you know what, St. Mary basically got used her and abused her and left her. I mean, it's not that raw, but that's kind of the feeling that's given. That St. Mary, she was just a vessel, she was just a, a vehicle. Jesus passed through her, he took from her what he needed, and that was it. Okay? And we, don't, we, don't, we find that's actually also a deviation from how the early church viewed her. Because again, what we say about her has a lot to say about what we say about the church, the body of Christ, okay? So, so the, the response oftentimes when you have a polar, uh, polar, polarizing position, the opposite of response often becomes polarizing. And what I would say if you look back throughout history, whenever you find a heresy starting to form, and I'm, I'm not using heresy in this context, but I'm saying in general, when you look throughout history and you find a heresy, oftentimes what you find is the response goes to the opposite extreme. This is exactly what happened with Nestorius. One of the guys who responded to him was a guy named Eutychius, who was a cop. He was an Alexandrian, okay? And he responded and said, no, 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 no. God swallowed up the divine nature, pretty much swallowed up the human nature, okay? For that reason that some people would refer to the Orientals as monophysites, that's a discussion for a different day though, okay? So all I'm saying is a lot of times the response becomes polarizing and it deviates from the actual truth which is usually in the middle, okay? Why does it matter? Before we go to that, let's look at the orthodox understanding of salvation, okay? Orthodox understanding of salvation, I think, this icon does such a good job of summing up our understanding of salvation, and this has as much to do with St. Mary as it does to do with us and who we are as the people of God, the children of God. Through Christ, you and I are given the possibility to again become united with God. Okay? For us, salvation is not simply... It's not simply
It's not simply having a legal transaction where one righteous life replaces all the unrighteousness in the world. For us, salvation is not something is being offered up to God so that all of these bad things throughout human history can be wiped and forgiven. Okay? For us, salvation is accomplished in the person of Christ, where we find the human divine union in Christ so that you and I can be restored back to our first purpose, which was to live a life of communion with God. See, I think what happens a lot of times is we think salvation is, and this affects, by the way, I want you to think about when you go to confession. If confession for me is simply seen as I need to have a transaction where I need to empty the bucket of sins, this is a distortion. This is, not, this is more of a Western view of salvation, which affects how I view any of the mysteries in the church. Okay? So confession, if it's just I'm coming to empty the bucket because the transaction needs to be accomplished only through the blood of Christ, and that's the focus, rather than I need to have the image restored back into me, which only comes through a divine human union, and I'm coming to confess that I have, that the image of God has become distorted in me, the way I approach confession is very different. The way I approach the Eucharist is very different. The way I approach baptism is different. The way I approach the scripture is different. The way I approach life in general is different. Because our purpose is not to become good boys and girls. Our purpose is to be in communion with God. Which we were saying last week, the result of that is that our life, people will look and say, those are good boys and girls. Or men and women. Okay? And your case. Right. My case, boys and girls. Your case, men and women. Okay? Boys, sorry, not girls. All right, so, so this is the distinction between our understanding of salvation and what we find right here in this icon. We find Christ in white, right? The uncreated light is why he's dressed in white. And he puts on red, which is symbolic of what? Humanity. What St. Mary's lower garment? Red, which is a humanity. Okay? So he took the red, the humanity from, from St. Mary, and as a result of that, she receives the heavenly inheritance, which is in blue. Okay? Which only comes by being in communion with the Son, by being with the Son, by being in the Son, by being next to the Son, by being all those things at the same very time, at the same exact time. Okay? Yes. In what you just explained about the difference to, uh, in the way we approach the sacraments, do you have do you have a practical example that you could share with us? Yes. Can we hold it to the end? Okay. Absolutely. I'll come to that. The first person who was, if you will, saved was Saint Mary. Because she lived in a divine human union with the Word. She was the first Christian. She was the first one to experience theosis or salvation or sanctification, or whatever you want to call it. Whatever language you want to use, she was the first person to experience that. And she experienced it in an unrepeatable way, but still, only because in a, in a true physical sense, he was within her. But in a very distinct way, we also are able to experience that by extension of what she did, okay? Or rather, what he did in her. Or maybe better yet, what they did together, okay? When we look at the fall, we look at the first Eve. The first Eve led, drove Adam to disobedience. The first Adam separated us, humans, from God with disobedience and egotism, okay? The second Adam allows us to experience, one, once again, divine human union. He restores us back to intimacy with God. And that presupposes that the second Eve accepted and fully submitted her will to God. 
Okay. Does this impinge upon the uniqueness of Christ's work? Only if we have an historian view of salvation. Only if we believe that God dwelt inside of a person and didn't become united with that person. Okay? Only then does it cause a conflict for us. Because what we can clearly say is that Christ is the Savior. He is, he is the Savior. He saved us. But we can also say that St. Mary is our role model as humans. Because she completely submitted her will to God. She was the first person to do that. In the fullest, truest sense of the word. And as a result of that, she became one with God in a really unique way. Three reasons why this matters, and then we'll jump into some questions. First thing, first reason is that it reminds us that saying yes is necessary. We have to say yes to God. It's a, it's a necessity. I was sharing with you all earlier that in the early church, there was a practice where no matter how old you were baptized, at some point, you would come before the altar and say yes to God. Okay? It's a necessity from us to respond because salvation comes by synergy of God's grace working with our will. Augustine, in uh, one of his sermons, he says that God created us without us, but he did not will to save us without us. In other words, he will not save us against our will or without our will. Synergy is God's plan working through human will. And the best time to say yes is always today. 2 Corinthians 6, 2, St. Paul says, reminds us that today is the day of salvation. Salvation is not a tomorrow thing. Saying yes to God is not a tomorrow thing. Saying yes is a today thing, and it's always a today thing. And when tomorrow comes, even though I've said yes today, I'll say yes again tomorrow. And then the day after, I'll continue to say yes. And so saying yes is a necessity in our own journey and process of being saved. The second principle is that when we say yes, we are choosing life. It's a choice. When St. Mary said yes, she's, she was choosing life. She chose life. We said in the Litany of the Gospel, you are the salvation of us all. You're the hope of us all, healing of us all, resurrection. You are the life of us all. He is life. So when she said yes to God, she was choosing life. Our yes to God is primarily a yes to the gift of life in Christ. When we say yes, we're primarily choosing to say yes to the gift of life. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. Moses says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. When we choose life, when we choose Christ, when we say yes, we're choosing life. It's for that reason that we say that St. Mary, in a sense, is our mother. She chose life. When I look at a spiritual father, I say he's my father. He chose life. And that's why I choose to go and be discipled by him. So we have spiritual fathers and we have spiritual mothers who have said yes. And so it's for that reason that we can call them mothers and fathers. St. Paul said to Timothy, you have many fathers or teachers, but you only have one father. One father who begot him into the faith. So what we're saying is that St. Mary chose life. And by extension, because of her choosing life, that life came into the world, you and I now have access to life who's Christ. Now, let's not miss it. I'm not saying, I'm saying very clearly, salvation is only through Jesus Christ. Okay? But when we say yes, when we say yes, brings us to our third point, which is our yes or your yes can lead to incarnational access to others. And this is exactly what happened with St. Mary. When St. Mary said yes, led to incarnational access for many other people. Okay? When you and I say yes, it leads to incarnational access to all the people around us. Her yes to God 
with all herself, totally drew herself towards God, and totally drew God towards the world. Okay? Acts chapter 13, verse 1. We read, Now, in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. The church in Antioch said yes. St. Paul and St. Barnabas said yes. And as a result of their yes, incarnational access was made to the Gentiles. It was made to us. Okay. So when we say yes, the word becomes available to other people through his body in the church. Years ago, back in 1999, I met a guy named Mark in a gas station who said yes to God. He said yes years earlier. And every time I would see this guy, he would ask me, have you said yes? He said it differently than that, but basically he said, have you said yes? And he kept asking me every time I saw him, have you said yes yet? Have you said yes yet? And every time I saw him, I kind of laughed at him. Until one day I realized I never said yes. And it was at that point that I chose to say yes. And ever since then, I continue to choose to say yes. And the more I choose to say yes, the more he becomes available to other people through my life. And every time you and I choose to say yes, he becomes available to other people through our life and our love to him and to the world. I want to ask you simply, the persons who have most deeply impacted and impacted your life, we honor those people. We revere those people. We respect those people. I'll be honest, Mark, that guy, like I have such a deep love and feeling of indebtedness for what God did for me through his life. At my engagement, I invited him to come and to sing a song at, uh, at our engagement party. Only because of what he did for me. I wanted to honor what he had done for me in my own journey with Christ, or this, the, the start of my journey again with Christ. For people who have a difficult time with the whole concept of we honor St. Mary, I see no difference between me honoring someone who has encouraged me in my own walk and made the incarnate word accessible to me where I'm at than when we look at St. Mary who made the incarnate word accessible to the world through her choice to continue choosing to be in the word and to completely submit her will to the logo so that he could come and save us. It's for that reason, guys, that we honor her because she said yes. And she said yes with all of her heart. And she said yes with all of her life. And she said yes in spite of the pain and suffering that she knew was coming. It's for that reason that we honor her. Because through that choice, the word was, was born and came to us. The more we surrender our will to God, the more the healing power of Jesus Christ becomes accessible. I want to invite you all today to really seek a life of surrender and submission. I know you all spoke quite a bit about this yesterday at the, the, the retreat, the conference, but I think probably the best place to start and surrender is on our knees in prayer. When we get down on our knees in prayer and we say yes, we say yes to God, whatever it takes, whatever you're calling me to do, I believe that's where it starts. It doesn't start by saying yes outside. It doesn't start by saying yes here. It starts by when we go home and we get on our knees or we stand in prayer and we say yes to God and we completely surrender ourselves to Him. We say, let it be to me, according to you. All glory to His name.